Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Fallout 4 on the PC with a few mods installed. I'm your host, Colors Fade, in survival mode, by the way, I should add that. It's episode 54. McCready and I are here camped out at Hangman's Alley. Sorry about that, I have to get this video started. And OBS Studio doesn't have a way to do it with a hotkey and also have, at the same time, an identifier on the screen. So that's the problem with using hotkeys is you don't know for sure that it started. So I have to alt tab out, which is always an issue. I wish it wasn't, but if you ain't been up to see Grey Garden, I hear guys shoot. It's always run by robots. It's always an issue. All right, uh, we're gonna take a a nap. That's how we started the last episode by. By ending here in Hangman's Alley, we got a lot of stuff done last episode. And people who are familiar with this channel should know that um, things always get interesting when I start to drink alcohol. And tonight I'm having some whiskey because I can. Where's all that noise at? I don't have my suit on, of course, but... So, this could be a very chatty episode, which could always end up being a lot of fun. I mean, you can watch anybody play video games, you watch me to listen to me ramble, right? Okay, let's see what's going on with... Long road ahead, travel to the Mass Pike Interchange. I would very much like to do that quest. Uh, I still need to report to the Knights. Clint, talk to Preston Garvey. That was the thing that I really wanted to do, was talk to Preston first, so. I'm gonna do that. Unfortunately, I should. I should have put in one of the other fusion cores, but whatever. Tonight's whiskey of choice is Crown Royale. Um, I have just recently discovered they have something called Crown Royale Black, which is fantastic. 32 fuel remaining, so let's go to the castle and talk to Preston. I really like the uh, Crown Royal Black. It's quite good. Top shelf stuff. Only thing I'm looking for while we're here is one of those funny looking hats. Oh, we have a cow. Well, here is a place where we can actually have a cow. And that's... That turned out a little funnier than I meant it to be. Have a cow. That's an old phrase. You're probably too old to remember when that was a thing. There are 10 beds and 15 people. So we definitely have enough people here so we can turn this thing off. Turn it off. There we go. Let's make some more beds for everybody. Perfect. The castle is a perfect... This is perfect. Come in here and get rid of that. And make some more beds. The castle is one of those places you like to have a lot of beds. Because you like to have a lot of people here. And then you want to be able to set them all up to arm positions. The old bunkhouse. Trouble at Hangman's Alley. We just left there. Oh my goodness. Well, fortunately, we're going to be going back in that direction to get to Overland Station, so it's not a big deal. That's really funny, though. Trouble at Hangman's Alley. And we don't really have the resources at Hangman's Alley to stop it, so it'll be fun to go back there. All right. Preston, my man. The Minutemen are on a roll. <laughs> I helped that settlement you sent me to and cleared the way for a new settlement in the process. That's fantastic news. We're going to take back the whole Commonwealth from the bad guys at this rate. I'll let you know if I hear of any settlements that need our help. In the meantime, make sure to offer help to anyone that needs it. That can only help our cause. That kills me. I've never actually heard that line from him before. That was really funny. The Minutemen are on a roll. I like that. Okay, um... Pick all this darn corn. I need melons for you guys though, don't I? Yeah, there's some gourds over here, but it's really melons that I need because the melons are uh, the food that I believe is actually used for 
melon. Where are Melons. There's 17. I think these are the ones that are used for fuel. So I'm gonna set some down here. Okay, uh, I'd like to get some more defenses here. Defense is 32, which is actually pretty strong. Can I get... You're manning that, which is great. This wall needs to be rebuilt, eventually. Which should be fantastic. Is there anybody manning this station up here? Oh, no. I need somebody for that. Okay. I need someone... What are you doing? You person over here. I got a job for you. I love the Minutemen. I, I was so surprised when the game came out and I saw this part of it because I didn't expect this at all. And I just thought it was one of the coolest things. Uh, we can build another one of those, can't we? Yep. How many more of these can we build? 27! Oh, yeah. Oh, I have 2100 wood now? Super, because what I'm going to do is... I like to have two or three of these things over here because they can help hit some of these locations in a... Alright, I need a person for this. Who's here? That can do it. Who is here that can do it? Preston Garvey, he's not gonna do it. I can't, I can't assign him, can I? Can I assign Preston? No way, really, I can't? Oh, that's sweet, the difference is 44 now. Preston will go arm that thing. Let's see if he stays on that or if he keeps wandering around. I'm going to be really curious about that. Okay, we have to go back to Hangman's Alley. But first I have to have something to drink. Aid. Drinks. Oh, gosh. No, I didn't mean to have the moonshine. Down the hatch. Yeah, that's right. Uh, McCready. Hold on. Oh yeah, there's that bot. I got an idea about that too. Um, I like to turn Hera into a big, big robot. Because she can really stay here and help protect the place. My character's all having booze just like I am in real life. It's like, hey booze, great. That whole thing is pretty funny. It just surprised me where they took this game from Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas to here. I really did think the settlement building was just going to be stupid. And I couldn't understand the appeal of it. And actually, for a person who likes to play survival mode like me, even being able to do something as dumb as just fill water bottles is amazingly satisfying. Building these settlements out and stuff, is just, it's just surprising how much entertainment I got out of that. Let's see. Can I do something with her? Oh yeah, it won't let me do that here. Sorry. I to do this first. Okay. Automatron 395. There you are. I want your torso to be not a protector and torso. A sentry torso. Yes. How much of this stuff do I have? Legs. How do I, where do I get to your legs? Not the torso. Legs. Space sentry legs. Sentry legs. Space sentry legs. Superior carrying capacity. Increase improved movement speed. 100 health, 150 carry rate, restricted movement, and tight spaces. I'm going to go space sentry legs. Let's see what happens. Left leg armor, factory armor, space armor, improved damage and energy resistance, adds space bot paint, 
moves paint mods. Primal st I don't care about primal storage plate. Plus five damage resistance. Plus six damage resistance. Wow, there's a ton of them. Hydraulic frame. Plus 25 damage resistance. Plus 25 energy resistance. And plus 10 carry weight. Left leg hydraulic frame. Yeah, so this is plus 25s. It's either that or the voltaic frame, which is plus 20 and plus 2 energy damage. I'm gonna go with the hydraulic frame. I'm probably. I'm probably wasting a whole bunch of resources on this, but it's the. Yeah, there goes the adhesive. What can I do for the left arm? Can I do. I can't do sentry left arm because I don't have any more adhesive. Hold on. I'm not done. I'm not done with you. I got plans for you. I just need, uh, right here. Utility. Cutting fluid. And then, how do I make... Fuel, cutting fluid, stealth boy, salvage beacons, wait a minute. I thought there was a way to make... Is it cooking? Let's try it. Where's the stove? Look at all these things. I can't wait to replace all these. Where's the stove? I put it somewhere. Maybe I didn't. I thought it was over here. But maybe I am wrong. Yeah, maybe it was just the whole time it was the cut. Okay. The whole time it was that. So let's do this. Crafting. No. Darn it. Let's go. Let's go. Stove. Cooking. Chemistry. Compact, compact, compact. Cooking station. Not that one. Not that one. The cooking stove. You know, if you're gonna make math, make sure you have the cooking stove there. Utility. Vegetable starch comes from purified water, corn, mute fruit, and potatoes. Perfect, but at least I can make a whole bunch of it. I need more potatoes then. Oh, so that's the value of potatoes. Well, there's a bunch of those at Oberlin Station, so we'll pick those. Um, Alright, let's get you back. Automaton. Left arm. You, nope. You are a sentry arm. Thank you. And the right arm is sentry arm. Oh, and we had one, so it already used it. So that's great. Right arm armor. Hydraulic frame. And the left arm. Left arm armor. Hydraulic frame. Voltec does plus two energy damage. So the left arm needs to be an energy weapon. Or oh, plus four damage resistant. No. Yeah. So we're gonna do a Voltec frame on the left arm, and we want to put an energy weapon on that thing. It's gonna be a uh, some kind of big laser. Oh, this this is great. There's so many good Gatling left hand laser Gatling gun. Thank you. That's brilliant. And then the right arm can do. Uh, it's got a protector on right hand claw, or we can go for. Right hand missile launcher. You are a very, very nice robot. Jezebel's head. Oh yeah, so the head armor can be Spartan helm. Oh, this is cool. Turtle helm. Cyclops helm. Oh my god. Head actuated frame. Head hydraulic frame. Oh my goodness. These are all really funny. No head armor. Head factory armor. Goblin head, damage resistance, damage resistance, plus 50 melee damage. I don't. She's not doing melee damage. So mesmatron damage plus 100% mesmatron damage. Ooh. 2% chance to break on you, so I'm not going to use any of those. I don't want to use anything that could break. Energy resistance. Yeah, head actuated frame or hydraulic frame. Oh yeah, let's do that. Okay. 
Now, miscellaneous mod. Oh, hacking module, stealth field. Ooh. Well, I'm not gonna do any of the rest of that. You, I wanted to paint you. Rear armor. This is Radio Freedom, broadcasting all day, all across the Commonwealth. Nothing to report. Front armor, sentry torso. Okay. Paint. Yes. No paint. Aqua paint. Black paint. Let's see. Oh. Aqua paint. Here we go. Black. Blue. Dark blue. I like that. That's sexy. Dark green. No. Light blue paint. No. Olive green. No. I'm looking at maybe the red. Vanilla. No. Red paint. I either want her to be red or that dark blue was kind of awesome dark blue paint oh baby oh Jezebel protect my people honey oh my goodness come on that is awesome she's got a missile launcher she's worth 15 defensive points on her own that woman is glorious okay food all right so now we're gonna go oh my goodness she is just that is awesome come on you got to be happy with that I finally gave you a good body you are a tank okay hangman's alley let's get ready to defend this place And then I gotta figure out. My back hurts. My feet hurt. Okay. Never Who am I defending? Where's my people? And it said Hangman's Alley, so this apparently is not the show up kind of trouble. We could really use your help. That's what I'm here for. Yes, I'm here to help. What's going on? There's a group of raiders that won't leave us alone. Stealing our food and supplies. Threatening us if we can't give them what they want. We know where they're coming from, but we can't stand up to them ourselves. Don't worry. I'll take care of those raiders for you. I hope so. We didn't know what to do. Next person that asked me to raiders are my to specialty. Kick. Can you get my Unless it's me. Hey. You, uh... What? Nick? Nick. Time to hit the road? No. Not now. Well. Be around if you change your mind. I thought you wanted to have a long conversation. Yes. Okay. Where are we going? What? Raider trouble. Kill the raiders at Backstreet Apparel again. Okay, we'll just get them next time. Um. Mass Pike Interchange is right there, and the closest place that we have to that is nothing. Nothing. We're better off wandering out there ourselves, and it's it's eight fourteen p.m. So here's the deal. I knew you would help us. Thanks for agreeing to help. Of course I'm gonna help. I'm just not gonna do it right this second. What I'm gonna do is snooze. Oh Piper, stop Nobody's at the ambush thing. Oh what's in here? Wait a minute. Is there nothing on that frame? There's nothing on that frame. Hold on a second. You know what I call a good day? A day when you get shagged? Because that's what I call a good day. I mean, I have a lot of good days, but honestly, come on. Shagging is a good day. Let's see. There's Tesla. There's a arm that's X01. There's a left arm that's X01, and there's a right arm that's X01. I've got two of them. There's... A helmet that's X01. There's more than one. There's a leg that's X01. There's another leg that's X01. And do I have a torso that's X01? Yes. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Wait a minute. Got a dangerous look about you. That's because I'm a badass. That is because, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am Iron Man. Oh, you are. You're going to be pretty. I'm going to paint you up because I don't have to wear you. I'm just going to paint you some really awesome color. Okay. Everybody else, have fun tonight. I'm going to sleep because my man and I got to go out in the morning and kill gunners. Which is going to give me some time to ramble because we're pretty much going to walk over there. Um, anybody who's been following my No Man's Sky series, if you have... If you're watching this and you're not wa watching the No Man's Sky stuff, you you might want to, because um, it's been kind of fun and it's kind of cool. But also because I rambled on 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 one of the episodes there about something, and that is uh, a project I'm working on that's outside the scope of me making videos for this channel. Uh, but. I guess what I want to say is, does anybody work on something that they're really passionate about that you can only work on for like short bursts of time because the work is so intense and you're so into it that it almost burns you out to do it longer than, you know, like an hour or so? I'm, I'm running into that and it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting experience. To work on something that's just uh, I'm very passionate about this project and I'm really enjoying it but it I'm finding that I can't work on it for long stretches of time like work is a different thing I'm a software developer I work on the .NET stack and you know yeah. you work 8 hours a day and you become accustomed to that and you can do it like it's not impossible, you know. Zeta guns, which I don't want. Um, but there's something about working on something that you're really passionate about. That there's a certain energy level there. That's kind of really high and and pretty powerful. And it and it just. It's, it's just an interesting... I got seven mini nukes. It's an interesting thing. It's an inter I don't think I need a mini nuke, actually. I'm going to put that back. It's just a, I'm having a really interesting reaction to working on this project and being like, wow, I can only do it for for so long before I'm like, I need, a, I need a break, and I need a substantial break. I need like a couple hours to just rest my brain. So that's why I've been spending... Like late at night doing on it, you know, so it's the last thing I can do before I go to bed, kind of thing, or whatever. But I'm just fascinated by that concept of really intense, um, a really intense feeling about a certain kind of work. It's just, and, and, and before anybody says anything, no, it's not, it's not pornography, so. No, I know, I know, I've had all the John Holmes comparisons, people. I've heard them all. I really have, honestly. It started the day I walked into the military. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know who John Holmes was, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my name was attached to him. Which reminds me, I have to, I have to tell a really funny story. And the odds of, um, the odds of this person hearing this story are probably slim to none. Um. It's too bad. There are actually some guys. There are guys from the time when I was in the military who I would really like to reconnect with. Because some of them are really cool and some of them did me huge favors. And I probably should talk about some of this while I'm, while I'm gaming because I think people might find some of it fascinating. First, let's go kill these things up here that are obviously not my guys. Who's that? Is that one of my guys? Is that a, yeah, it is one of my guys. Never mind, I was wrong. Um, but let me tell this story because this is a funny story. Military guys have some of the best stories. We really do. When I went in, the day that I went in from the MEP station, which is right the last place you're processed before they put you on a plane and send you to basic training, I had pretty long hair. I had a mullet. It was horrible. I'm, there's no excuse for it. We should have never done those things to our hair. 
They were really terrible, but we did them. I had the second longest hair of anybody in my flight, of my 50-man flight when we got to when we got down to San Antonio, Texas, because I was in the Air Force. But one other guy had longer hair than I did. But that's not the funny part. The funny part is drill sergeants, which we call technical instructors in the Air Force, so we call them TIs. We don't call them drill sergeants. TIs like to find a way to single you out. And of course, having long hair is one of the easier ways to do that. But forget about that. There was a there was a, a guy on our flight who I think was probably a pretty pretty nice guy, um, and he was uh, he was an African American with from what I remember short hair and a very and a very solid physique you know not not a big rock of muscle or anything just a, a nice well built kid it looked like he was probably had been pretty athletic in high school maybe. And unfortunately for him, on the very first day when we're all still wearing civilian clothes, he was wearing a bum equipment t-shirt. Now, if you've never been in the military, you probably can't imagine what that means. What that meant for him was his name from that moment on for the wow. next six weeks was bum. I have actually no recollection of what his real name was. He was simply bum. And the TI would yell that at him. Bum! Get over here, bum! And, of course, it's funny at first, but then after a while you immediately feel sorry for the guy because for the next six weeks, he's just bum. And that's the way TIs operate. So... Just so you know, that's that's what it's like. And for anybody who's curious, because sometimes people ask that, yes, military has been represented in movies often, a lot, quite a bit. And when people ask me, what's the most realistic depiction that you have ever seen in film? And that is so easy for me to answer first of all yes saving private ryan d-day for the people i i have heard from who were at d-day on world war one they're like it was that looked as real as this ever looked great but for being in the military for the representation of boot camp and everything else nothing beats full metal jacket and of course the uh, very famous drill sergeant turned actor uh, I think it is his name Emery or something like that. It's something like that. And he was brilliant. But that looked like a named person, which makes me want to go up there and find out who that was. But uh, I want to say his name was Emery, and I can't. You know, you all know who I'm talking about because he got typecast as a drill instructor from then on. Because he was a real, a real marine drill instructor, and he was, and he was brilliant in that movie, Full Metal Jacket. It was fantastic. Kill him! Can you kill him? Good job. Raider. But at any rate. If you want an idea of what boot camp in any branch of the service is like, it's like that. It's like Full Metal Jacket, and they did such a great job with that. You could just tell watching it that somebody who had real experience with the military wrote that. There's just no, there's no other way to explain that. Somebody who actually was in boot camp wrote that and wrote all those scenes because it was 100% accurate it was just uh, it was killing me when he's in there yelling at him and calling him calling them names and things like that for instance the guy the guy in my flight who had longer hair than I did um, 
I think he got called Joker. You know, and so it's stuff like that. You just, you can't, you can't make that stuff up. That's how drill instructors really are. It's, it was kind of an amazing experience. Um, boot camp, certainly not one of my favorite times in my life. And, and, uh, without question, uh, definitely one of the harder things I've ever done in my life. That bear is chasing that thing. That's awesome. Go chase it, dude. Yeah, go get it. Leave me alone. Definitely hard. Boot camp. It doesn't matter if you're in. It doesn't matter what branch of service you're in because they all do it differently. It's it's designed to be difficult in different ways. You know, for the for the Marines, it's different because it's very physical for them. And same thing with the Army. You know, you screw up in the Marines and it's drop and give me twenty. Um, you screw up in the Air Force and and. It's more of a, a way more of a mental game. And it just the whole the whole thing wears on you very quickly. And of course with all the sleep deprivation and all the work you have to do and all those kinds of things, it's just it's like you can't you you definitely don't feel like it at any point in time you ever catch a break at all and when you finally do start to to feel like you're catching a break then then they intentionally get you yeah, aiming at nothing there here he comes get your get your gun up there ding dong okay and and let me tell you about about them intentionally going after people because I actually witnessed it in in my boot camp and it was a brilliant bit of psychology. Um, I'll share that story here tonight as well since I'm just meandering on this episode. We want to get to Mass Pike Interchange, which is we're almost in the right direction. It's over there. Okay, I want to go down to this house first. And look at this. Um, there was a, a gentleman in my flight, and I actually do remember his name because he was a specimen. Um, the fellow's name was Sellers. That's his last name. I don't remember anybody's first names, and I'm pretty sure nobody does. We all knew our last names, and that's it. And of course, your TI is always yelling at you using your last name, so that's all you're known for. But Sellers had apparently been dreaming of being in the military since he was young and so he was he was a fit dude super fit for for an 18 year old just in the best shape of his life and he was on his p's and q's all the time knew exactly what he was doing did exactly what was asked of him at all times and in fact he uh tried out for the Air Force's version of the SEALs, which is called the Pararescue. Para um, you have to be super fit to, to even get into entrance into that. And uh, I remember you have to swim like a mile and a half, then you have to run three miles, and then you have to do so many pull-ups and so many sit-ups. And I guess the pull-ups are last, and he missed it by two pull-ups. I don't... It is incredible. You know, he did like 27 pull-ups or something, I don't know, and after doing everything within the right amount of time that he was supposed to do. It was amazing. And they just told him, he said, well, you know, you're welcome to come back and try again <laughs> anytime that you want to. <laughs> kind of thing. But Sellers, just super fit dudes. And super on his P's and Q's, always doing everything exactly the right way. You know, which is, which is hard to wow. do when you're in boot camp so here was the here was the funny part this is how this is how the TIs went after, went after him because they didn't want him thinking that he was succeeding you know that their whole job in boot camp is to knock you down and then build you back up and if you're if you're a confident person and you think you're doing everything right then that knocking you down part doesn't happen so they have to knock you back down they have to do it somehow, right? So they did it with sellers. 
And the way that they did it for him is we had a, a locker inspection. You're always having inspections when you're in the military all the time. And we had an inspection in our, you know, in your, I don't want to call it a dorm, in your barracks. That's the correct word. It's, it's certainly not a dorm. It's a barracks, a big room with 50 guys in it. You know, it's a... Quite the ordeal. Yeah, because I'm down here, ding dong. And at any rate, Sellers had everything perfect. Well, when you get your BDUs issued to her, to you, or at least when you got them issued in in 1991, I guess was what I went was that it, when I was in boot camp. Anyway, in 1991, you get your BDUs, which is your your camouflage uniform. They call them BDUs. They're battle dress uniform. And you get those issued, and in every single... that There are tons of pockets on them. I mean, guys are getting crap all the time for wearing cargo shorts, but dudes, I guarantee you, so many of the guys that actually are in love with cargo shorts are ex-military because they're like, dude, my BDUs had four times as many pockets as these cargo shorts had. We're used, we're accustomed to having a lot of pockets to work with. <laughs> so your camouflage BDUs had a lot of pockets. And in every single one of those pockets is a little paper tag that has some information about how the BDUs were inspected or whatever, you know, something like that. At any rate, it has that information. Well, your job when you get issued those BDUs is to remove all those tags. You can't have those tags in your BDUs. And if your BDUs get inspected when they're in their locker and they have those tags, you get you get demerits for those and everybody gets in trouble. And it's not it's not a good thing. Okay, hold on. You're being a turkey, so That, that helped. There's this other dude. How'd that feel? You like that? How you like me now? How you like the exploding gun? Who's this guy down here? Who are you? Barnes? I just like to sp spray the exploding bullets here. What do we got left? Oh, yeah, done. So at any rate, you can probably see where this story is going. Sellers is on his P's and Q's, man. He he's got everything right. He's doing everything right. So he gets his BDUs like the rest of us, and just like the rest of us in the same room, we all know because we all watched it. We get our BDUs. I can't remember how many we got issued. Two, three uniforms, something like that. He empties out every single pocket, pulls every single one of those pieces of paper out of them. They're all gone. They're all in the waste bin. Well, you know, two, three weeks down the line. We're getting an inspection, and the TI can tell. The seller's guy. He's on it. He's on his P's and Q's. He really thinks he's exceeding. He's thwarting us. With the drill sergeants, we gotta break them down. So what do we do? They have an inspection now. Nor now, a lot of times when they have an inspection, you all just stand at attention next to your locker and they inspect your locker. Not this time. They send us all downstairs outside the barracks and make us stand at attention in flight order. We can't see what the hell's going on. We don't know what the TI is doing. They're up there for an awful long time. Here they come down. All right, you guys can go back into your barracks. And there's Sellers on his bed. A whole ton of little paper tags that come from the inside of BDUs. Not his BDUs, mind you. 
because by God, we watched him. He emptied every single one of those out of there, man. Just like the rest of us did. They did not exist inside his his uniform anywhere. But there they were, laying on his bed. Demerits all over the place. Give me a 341. You're in trouble, sellers. You didn't take your paper slips from your uniform like you were supposed to. Dude, you should have seen Sellers' face. Complete disbelief. Of course, there's also a second benefit to this that the military very much wants you to do as well. Immediately after the TI leaves, there's a whole bunch of us running over to Sellers, patting him on the shoulder, saying, Dude, we know. We know this is bullshit. It's bogus. They set you up. It's a setup job. We know that. And you know what? That was perfect because that's exactly what our TI wanted us to do. Work as a team and have each other's backs. And there we were, Pat and Sellers on the back saying, we got your back, man. We know this is bogus. They're doing that on purpose, you know? They're pitting their TI against you as a team. We didn't know that. We're a bunch of dumb kids. We didn't know the game they were playing, but that's what they were doing. So, and you know, you walk out of there six weeks later and you all feel pretty good about yourself and they broke you down and they built you back up and you know how to fold the shirt correctly and you know how to listen to orders correctly and you know how to carry out your orders correctly and that's the beginning of your military career. Hi. What's up? Hi. Well, that should send a message to the gunners to stay off my back. I'm sure they heard you loud and clear. Definitely. The gunners, it's always about the bottom line. They just lost this entire way station, and that cost them big. Besides, they have no way of knowing I was involved. Anyway, I guess I owe you a favor now. After all, you hired me, but I'm the one that dragged you out here. You don't owe me. You clearly needed the help. Sure, but I like everything to remain nice and even. And you're one up on me. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you back the cap you paid me in good neighbor. I'll still stick with you because that was part of the original deal, but now we're even. There you go. I guess we're done here. Lead on, boss. So Sellers, dude who was in the, uh, who was in basic training in San Antonio sometime in... 1991, April of 1991, I think is when we were all there together. Right before the massive heat starts to hit in the old uh, San Antonio summer. Hats off to you. I thought you were an incredibly awesome dude. I admired the hell out of you. I admired the shape that you were in. You were so physically fit. So much more physically fit than anybody else in our flight. And uh, if I had to guess, I would imagine Sellers ended up being a lifer. Probably, because he seemed to have a real love for the military. But uh, hat tip to you, man. We know the TI screwed you in. You did good anyways, I'm sure. Heckish from lack of food. Well, wouldn't you be? Me, I, uh... I spent... Oh, you can get in there. I spent two years active duty working in a top secret electronics laboratory for the United States military, for the United States Air Force. Um, I was trained to work on nuclear missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And then I got to my permanent duty assignment and they saw my tech school scores and they said, we are sticking you in a top secret electronics laboratory because you are a true egghead. And, and um, there were parts about that job I really loved. And other parts that I wasn't so fond about. But I was happy I did it. I was happy I spent my time there. Don't move, you turd. I'm gonna shoot you in the butt. There you go. Sarge! I got shot in the buttocks! Alright. Down we go. Um, 
But then after, I, I did something really, really rare. In case you kids out there want to know, it's called a palace chase. It actually does exist, and everybody on your military base will tell you it does not. Because they, they, they don't want you to do it. They don't want to lose you. They spend a bunch of money to, to train you. And in my case, they spent a bunch of money to give me a top secret security clearance, too. Security clearances are not cheap. And they did that, and, and that was fantastic, but I saw an opportunity, and one of the reasons that you can, one of the legitimate reasons that you can palace chase out of active duty military and into the National Guard, where you only have to serve one week in a month and two weeks a year, is to attend college. Uh, and I knew right away after being in the military for two years that college was going to be more my speed um, and that's not a knock on the military by the way I'm really proud that I served and the military is full of great people with high integrity a lot of them are it's and you know we need it I mean face it in the world we live in that we've lived in since World War one and before we need a, we need a strong national military and, and, and ours is a volunteer army uh, which is kind of even more impressive because you got people like me and all my friends and people who've done it who who sign away X number of years of their life voluntarily knowing that the military is going to use you however they want to use you and you may not necessarily agree with everything that they choose to do with you politically you may you may take offense to what they do but you are bound by your oath you're there to protect the Constitution of the United States. You're there to follow orders. And that's what you do. And we all did it with a great amount of pride. And it was it was a challenge, but it's what we did. But my desire to, to get into the, the private sector had to, a lot more to do with immediacy of making an impact. Um, and, and I'll explain what that means is partway through my tenure... In electronics laboratory I found a way to do something more efficiently and you will see that in in the military the military has a technical manual for everything there's actually a technical manual for how to put a seat belt on when you're in a, in a military vehicle and that's not a lie uh, they actually have technical manuals for everything and, and part of it I think is a, an accountability issue but that's just the way the military operates and when we were in electronics laboratory everything that we did was governed by big thick technical manuals who are you shooting at? And so these big tech, these big thick technical manuals tell you step by step how to perform your job on a specific piece of equipment. For instance, it'll say you need to, to check this, and you need to check that, and then you need to check this, and you need to do it in this order, and you need to see these results. And if you don't, go to go to page 137 and do this. And it's all very explicit, right? But sometimes someone finds a more efficient way to get the same result and we submit those and they go through something that's kind of like change control and it's a long process and it can end up in, so you'll see these technical manuals with white pages and occasionally they have pink or green pages in them and those pages are changes they're pages that say oh do this other procedure instead because maybe it's more efficient and that is something that I discovered when I was in is I found a more efficient way to do something and I went to my boss, my immediate supervisor, and I said, hey, I think I found a more efficient way to do this process and get the correct result. And he looked at my work and he said, you're absolutely right. You did find a more efficient way to do this. And I said, well, how long is it going to take before this, before this more efficient method is actually in the technical manual? And he said to me, well... It's about a two-year process. <laughs> and that was the moment when I said, uh, my, my brain, to a certain extent, is wasted here. I can make a big dif big, bigger difference somewhere else. I can make more immediate impact in the private sector. So 
and I'd already had a friend who told me about the palace chase and he said it's a real thing you can do it you can go to college you can get your degree and uh, that was that was what I decided to do and I, there is a there is a large amount of bureaucracy involved in the United States military and certainly a lot of it is necessary for safety reasons and I think we all understand that but when you're when you have my set of skills and I'm not trying to even brag or humble brag here but when you have my set of skills it's just a little bit wasted in an environment that's not going to let you make an immediate impact with that you know and that was actually what ended up being a huge pull for me to do computer programming because the very first time I started programming with a computer when I was an electrical engineering major in college and I saw your I saw the immediacy of programming of I can change a few lines of code and I can recompile this and bingo it's on the screen which was really impressive to me it was like I didn't have to wait two years to see a result I could see it right now and that was really appealing to me and it still is to this day the immediacy of that is really appealing alright so we've done this quest and then there's Raider Trouble at Hangman's Alley. We, we should probably go do that to end this episode because this is really quick. So let's go do that. I'm going to do that and then that will be a proper way to end this episode. I know I've rambled on. I should, I should subtitle this the military episode. You guys have probably learned way more about me in the military than you want to know. But I personally look back on all those years with a lot of fondness and a lot of pride because it's... It's something else to to say, yeah, sure, you can have four to six years of my life. Do whatever you want to with it. Uh, and if I get shot, okay, because I understand that that's part of the process. I understand that that's a possibility. You know, none of us know what we're gonna what we're gonna do in boot camp. None of us know where we're gonna get sent. And none of us know what our or what our final job is gonna be. Even when they guarantee you a job before you go in, they don't actually guarantee you a job. They guarantee you an area of work. So it's, you know, and I knew I wasn't going in the Marines and I knew I wasn't going into the to Army and that worked out in, in my favor as far as keeping me alive because, because right after, right as I was going in, um, Desert, Desert Storm was at its height. Actually, I'm quite impressed. Yeah, thought you might be. I'm completely self-taught, you know. Picked up a sniper rifle when I was 10 and never looked back. I always thought it was smarter to hit my targets at long range. I mean, why take chances, right? I Besides, totally agree with that. I had to come up with every trick in the book to survive the capital wasteland. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been out there. Well, at least I wasn't alone. Lived underground in a place called Little Lamplight. I love that. Other kids. Left there when I was around 16. We kind of had a policy there. No adults. When you were 16, you packed up and left. I know, it sounds crazy, but having adults around was something we couldn't trust. Little Lamplight is actually, I think, one of the coolest parts of Fallout 3. That sounds ridiculous. Maybe, but kept the colony alive for a couple hundred years. <laughs> anyway, when I hit 16, I ended up wandering the Capital Wasteland for a while. I took the odd job here and there, but things were pretty hot with the Brotherhood of Steel running the show. So I hitched a ride with a caravan and made my way north until I ended up here. I made a pretty decent name for myself before I heard that the gunners needed some sharpshooters. Biggest mistake of my life. They were animals. Killed anything that moved if it got in their way. I went with it for a while because the caps were good, but... I don't know. I guess it started to catch up with me. So I quit. Which pretty much brings us to now. So there you have it. 
My whole life in a nutshell. I love that you can flirt with him. Even though I'm completely straight. I just think that's really cool that they put that in the game so that people have a choice. So that people who are homosexual can actually romance a male character. I just think that's the best thing in gaming is to be Come inclusive. It's so Earth, cool. Spaceman. Thanks for sharing that with me. Well, you've earned it. Look, I know I tend to be a pain in the ass. I mean, <laughs> I know I tend to be arrogant and I come off like I want to be alone. Nothing could be further from the truth. Being alone scares the heck out of me. Now that we've been traveling together for a while, I'm beginning to realize how much I missed having someone I could depend on. I just wanted you to know that I'm going to do everything I can to see that it stays this way. Well, that's all I had to say. Hope you got something out of all that. I did. Let's go kill bad guys. I, I and I know right away that immediately tags me as, as a left wing and a liberal, and everybody who's right wing watching this channel is gonna like stick their finger down their throat and want to puke. But I I really don't care what people's political affiliations are because I think I think everybody should be able to agree that inclusivity is important, and if you were if you were a person who was if you've ever been marginalized or picked on or bullied in any way which which happens to everybody of all walks of life it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is it doesn't matter what you think people people of all different walks of life get bullied and picked on so to be inclusive is a really important thing and i think there's just a ton of value in that. And I like that. I mean, the fact that this character, that you could potentially romance this character, doesn't affect me as a straight man, because I'm not going to romance it. I'm just going to treat him like a friend. You know? Alright, you guys are all going to die, and I would like to try something new. See, political affiliation doesn't matter when you're playing Fallout 4. All we care about is nuking people, right? Alright, dudes. Oh, that Merv grenade didn't, didn't do as much as damage as I thought it was going to do. I thought it was going to, like, nuke this whole place. But it did, it did nothing. Well, so much for that. Me? Nothing there now. What do you think? Nothing there now. Jumping the jacks. Yeah, you're probably right. Now I get that out of the jet. Listen. We're about to get busy here. Um Oh nothing. Oh well I didn't I didn't intend to pull this. Okay, let's do this. Oh come on. How was that? Well, completed. Kill the raiders now. Okay. Well, you know. <laughs> I love these guys. I love... Th One of the things that... I've talked about this before in previous episodes, but maybe for people who are new to the channel and haven't been following, one of the yes. things that I love and hate about Bethesda... I don't hate it, it just annoys me. Is, uh... Is the is the banter that they give all the other characters? So it's awesome to hear these guys talking and saying things, and their their dialogue is quite good. But it, it also sucks when you're in something like Skyrim, and the guard is telling you, after you're the Dovahkiin and you've rescued the whole entire world, and he's like, "Hey, sneak thief," and say, like, "Hey, I'm the Dovahkiin." That that dialogue should never come up for you after I have saved the world. That should just never happen. Or after it's established that I'm the Dovahkiin. That should just never happen. <laughs> so, so Bethesda is, is one of these companies, one of these game developers. I, I both love them and, and just shake my head at them. What do you think? There's more bodies in here. And well, 
Well, they're not bodies yet, but they're gonna be. Oh, how did how does that work for you guys? Dead? Does that work? I appreciate everybody watching this episode. Actually, I hope people watch this to the end. I see the stats on this kind of stuff. I know, I know when people watch videos to the end, and who spends a lot of time doing it. And um, I know I've really rambled this episode in particular, but I hope there's some value in all this rambling. I hope people listen to these military stories and things like that and think, you know, yep, that's real life. Real people, real life. This is how things work. This is the reasons people do things. And I also hope nobody takes offense at the fact that I palace chased. You know, I know... That's something I really don't talk about with a lot of people because you tell, you, let me tell you, you tell people that you were in the military and that you get, you immediately get the thank you for your service thing. And it's like, you know, first of all, I really appreciate that because you should probably thank all these people. Not because, listen, war stinks and none of us want to go to war. We are all are trained to do jobs that we hope we never have to do because our jobs involve killing people. You know, one way or another, whether you're a mechanic on an F-15 or whether you're a guy with a gun in your hand or you're a guy like me who worked on nuclear missiles which actually would, would end up killing hundreds of thousands of people at, at once. We're all trained to do jobs that we just honestly hope never have to happen. But we volunteer, and we do it for a lot of different reasons. And in the end, we all take a certain amount of pride from the fact that we did it. We, we ponied up, and we said, man, I am, I am scared to death of boot camp. And I'm scared to death leaving my family and doing this as a 17 or 18 or 19 year old kid. And I'm scared to death of getting my butt shot off and what the military might do with me and I went in right when Desert Storm was at its height and we all have the pin for it even though most of us don't wear it because we weren't in theater us nuclear guys it's a it's a frightening thing but we did it you know you did it and when it's all over and you're getting discharged with an honorable discharge and people are saying dude good job um, it's a, there's a real mix of emotions there. I still have it today. I still I still don't know how to process the whole thing. You know, it's it's just a really it's a really remarkable thing to sign your life over for four to six to twenty years to a government and say go ahead and do whatever you want. Um, and so I hope never, nobody ever takes issue with the fact that there are people like me who pals chase out. I served. That pals chase means you serve double the time you have left in the guard. So I had two years active duty left, which meant I had to serve four years in the guard. I was happy to do it. Uh, it allowed me to go to school. It allowed me to start family. It, it, I met some really great people in the guard. I have to say that um, my my shop chief. Master Sergeant Ken Bisbee is one of the absolute coolest people I had ever known. He's probably either very elderly by now or passed away. Um, I'm not kidding when I say he's one of the coolest people I've ever known. Really great guy. So, and the National Guard, you know, they have to be Can't remember the last have to be ready for all kinds of different things. So, that's what we were doing. Was getting ready all the time. All right, this episode has gone on long enough, and I have rambled the whole time, I which is kind of incredible. Let's finish this quest. Not many doctors. I took care of those raiders for you. Take a look. Really? Well, that's the best news I've heard in a long time. Well, you know, it is me. All right, folks, thanks for watching. As always, if you guys haven't, please subscribe to the channel. If you have a question or comment, drop it down below. I'm certainly willing to talk about just about anything, as you can tell. Especially when I get a little whiskey in me. So I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.